Hey, it's Pip, and here I am again at DFW Airport in Founders Plaza. And today, I know it's been several months since I've done a video, but today we're going to talk to a pilot who can tell us more about the relationship between pilot and dispatcher, and also about the ever-popular jump seat ride. Yes, it is Pip me again here with dispatchers answering your questions. Unfortunately, Morgan cannot join us today because he's pregnant. Well, I mean, his wife is pregnant. And so he is doing the right thing by taking care of his wife, and then he's probably gaining all the sympathy weight as well. But I've got something even better for you today. We're going to talk with uh, one of my good friends who's actually a pilot, who's been a captain and is now a first officer at a major airline. So without further ado, let's switch it up and talk over. And there he is, First Officer Mark, formerly Captain Mark. Captain Mark, actually First Officer Mark, see? I only know him this way. I actually worked with him at a regional airline, and so we had the opportunity to work together as both uh, me as a dispatcher and him as a captain and work together. So we're going to talk a little bit about the pilot-dispatcher relationship and, of course, something I get a lot of questions at uh, about the jump seat ride or your fam ride that you do. But first, let me tell you, or I should say let Mark tell you a little bit more about himself. I am a first officer to major airline flying uh, Airbuses. Um, used to be a first a captain at a uh, regional airline flying Embraer's mostly. Who is your favorite dispatcher? Oh, obviously, Dave Hastings, the man. Thank you. Uh, always gave us the fuel we needed, was on top of the flight plans. He uh, looked out for weather, never filed us through a thunderstorm once. Appreciate it. That's a great yeah. record. So, how long have you been a, a call it a professional pilot? Oh, depending on your definition, as long as. Uh, 14 years. 14 in years. You, it can include flight instructing. Um, I've been in the working with the airlines uh, for 11 years now. Right so, on. Uh, and uh, you love what you do? I do. It's surprising. I find uh, this job has a better home life balance than, you, than you'd expect. Pilots obviously spend a lot of time on the road, but the dirty little secret is we also spend a lot of time at home. So it's, uh, or you can call that the clean little secret. <laughs> All right. Well, I know there's a lot of questions people have. I know I've got uh, messages from people, but so we're going to focus the attention on, on you, though, uh, First Officer Mark. Uh, one of the questions I, I think a lot of people have is, tell me, uh, in your experience, when you were a captain, what was your relationship with a dispatcher, and how uh, do you guys work together, and how did they help you? On a normal day when everything is running great, the dispatcher basically does all the, uh, the research, all the planning, uh, everything to make the flight run smoothly. But there are cases where things come up uh, where we have to make a phone call and we get on the line with the dispatcher and ask for some additional fuel or ask for a change in routing. Uh, there could have been a, a change in the maintenance status of the aircraft, which could require a change to the flight plan. So what happens, uh, how would you best describe uh, the dispatcher-pilot relationship in, and how would you best describe a dispatcher um, in, in your eyes from a pilot? Dispatcher is like the manager on a baseball team. You don't see him out on the field, but without him, the job won't get done. Um, you... Kind of like the unseen eyes that yeah. nobody knows about. But That's right. They, they're the heart of the operation. Uh, they understand the big picture. They understand the constraints of uh, operation and what's going on at certain airports. They understand the uh, requirements for us to be able to head to certain airports. They uh, are on top of things. So I'm going to interrupt for a second because that's what dispatchers do. Uh, they're going to interrupt the flight plan and say that we're incredibly important to the operation and we obviously don't get paid enough because everybody thinks that that guy back there is the pretty face of the operation, which is true. Which is true, but we're the not as handsome faces the operation, keeping an eye 
and catching the big picture like Mark says. So I just wanted to, to give a shout out to my fellow dispatchers who are watching today. And I'm just going to put Mark out of the way for a quick second so you can focus your attention on me. Because let's face it, if it wasn't for the dispatchers, there would be no operation. Anyway, sorry, Mark, go back to what you were saying about uh, how great you are and how great the relationship is with pilots. Now, we've had the pleasure. My dispatcher keeps me great. Yeah. The, 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 um, in all truthfulness, if we don't work together, and I know this is me talking behind the camera, but if we don't work together as a team, nothing happens. Absolutely. Is it true that both signatures are required on the release before you can take off? It is. So... I'm going to interrupt for a second. That's one really important thing is that people need to understand that we need to be, the captain and dispatcher need, or the PIC need to be in unison as a team or else nothing happens. We, whether it comes to weather, whether it comes to safety, everything needs to be a concurrence. So there needs to be concurrence and working together. And that's the biggest thing. If you ever run into a captain that's not being a teammate or a dispatcher, vice versa, that's a problem. So you need to be unified on your decision to move forward. So back to uh, Captain Mark or First Officer Mark. I call him Captain Mark because we worked so well together and for so long at the regional airline. What is, I, another question that we get uh, is what is it like to uh, be in the jump seat and, and what should a dispatcher know when they are uh, doing their jump seat for the first time and be aware of? That's a good question. I'm a former captain and a former commuter. Uh, about three years ago, I moved to base, so I don't, don't spend nearly as much time in jump seats as I used to, but I was uh, riding as a jump seater a lot uh, in my previous job. So, I'm just going to put a shout out to the world's largest pilot union, uh, which is Alpha. Um, we love having dispatchers in, in the jump seat, and I will say that there's a lot that we see uh, from our side of the operation that is completely foreign to us from the other side of the operation. Uh, I had a dispatcher very clearly and succinctly explain to me some reasons that the airline had purchased one type of aircraft over another type of aircraft, or what we could expect in uh, routing in the future. So, you'll be welcome. Uh, just be prepared to answer some questions. Do you, uh, one of the hot button questions we get and talk about in the office is what's your opinion on beards when you were a captain or mustaches or facial hair? And, and why is that? Why, 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 uh, do they talk, why do we talk about that? What's the purpose behind being clean shaven, I guess? The traditional answer that has been given is that the oxygen masks that we may have to put on in emergency decompression may not, uh, satisfactory seal and we could get hypoxia while uh, wearing a mask if we had a beard. I have heard that that's been disproven and there are now European airlines allowing their flight crews to wear uh, facial hair in flight. At this point, the Federal Aviation Administration usually lags behind EASA in uh, regulatory affairs by a couple of years, just like we do on the pharmaceutical side. Um, but I think that there's also just an aspect of what the American public expects their pilot to look like. Uh, they, you see someone with a nice silly mustache and it's yeah. comforting. You see, uh, <laughs> like Ron Burgundy. Yeah, you see Ron Burgundy walk up into your flight deck, you feel pretty good. You see Zach Galifianakis walk into your flight deck, you're going to be nervous, I guess. <laughs> It's, it's good. So if you were a captain, uh, you're currently a first officer, do you have any problems with uh, facial hair as long as uh, they're uh, appropriately dressed? No. No. I don't believe so. So what's the the other thing is how, what should you look like when you go into your jump seat? The, when you request the captain to say, if, may I say, can you allow me, I should say, to uh, permission to sit in that jump seat? The industry standard is business casual. Uh, that, of course, is open to definition, but we would expect to see a collared shirt and some sort of pants other than jeans. Uh, jeans are probably going to fly with certain uh, certain pilots, especially if you're wearing a nicer shirt, but do not show up wearing shorts and flip-flops. No t-shirts? No. Uh, I would shy against t-shirts. Collared shirts. All right, so... We're gonna we're gonna take a little break from Marky Mark over here, and we're gonna focus on me again because when I did my first jump seat, I showed up in a shirt and tie, and 
and uh, you know I looked like a captain. However, uh, you know they looked at me a little weird, but there's nothing wrong with a shirt and tie. Mm -hmm. While we've got a second, you know the jump seat. You as a dispatcher have to do it uh, five hours every year, and you can reduce it through multiple landings or simulation time. But five hours is your requirement. So uh, just keep that in mind when you are working to become a dispatcher. And it's actually one of the funnest things. As you'll see, you can see the universe and the world from a whole different perspective. Instead of outside the window, you can view out the uh, flight deck and see what the pilots see, which is a really cool opportunity. But you also get to learn more about what they do with their job uh, gain greater respect and understand what they're doing because they're doing performance calculations, they're making determinations on weather, and so it all plays a, a crucial role, a crucial uh, role to do your fam ride. So before we close it up, Mark, First Officer Mark, what uh, anything else you want to add about the future of aviation and and being a pilot or a dispatcher? One more word about uh, being a jump seater. Uh, when you're a jump seater, you are a third crew member. Um, the dispatch is, uh, is seen as a third crew member already, uh, but uh, it becomes quite a literal thing. You can help us keep the lookout for traffic. You can help us understand air, air traffic control clearances or, or not miss radio calls. Get involved. You are an aviation professional, and uh, we welcome the expertise that you're able to, to lend. I think the future is bright. Uh, we don't know what changes to the paradigm technological changes or regulatory change. We will be needing pilots and we'll be needing dispatchers for a long time, so if you have any inclination of getting into this field, you've got a good career ahead of you. Oh, and I do have one more question. In your opinion, what what is the comfort level of the jump seat in most airplanes? <laughs> oh. How uncomfortable on a scale of 1 to 10? And how big is it? In a regional jet, your jump seat is not comfortable. Um, I, well, the Ember 175 has an okay jump seat. The CRJs and the, uh, the small Embraers, not so much. They feel pretty cramped. Uh, 737 jump seat is kind of, you're a little bit tucked away in a corner and it feels a little constrained, but the seat itself is fairly comfortable. Uh, I will say Airbus uh, A320 series aircraft are famous for having uh, comfortable jump seats and they're pretty nice. You are just sitting, it's kind of at a 90 degree angle where yeah. the seat comes out of the wall. Uh, but you do have a lot more space than you do in other type of aircraft. The most comfortable jump seat I've ever sat in is the, uh, the Airbus A220 aircraft. Uh, that is engineered similar to the CRJ jump seat since the, uh, the airplane was engineered by Bombardier. But the, uh, the jump seat itself is, is comfortable, it's spacious, uh, it's up there in the flight deck so you feel involved with the crew. Um, so that's, that's the best one. That's the best one. And if I may add, uh, the, uh, the uh, regional jets definitely are not too comfortable. It's like the equivalent of having a pizza box. <laughs> size wise sit down and it's it's got a little bit of cushioning but otherwise it's basically a hard metal chair so my advice is bring snacks bring an extra pair of clothes in case you divert uh, and uh, but bring plenty of food and plenty to drink because sometimes it can be a long ride for a two hour and your butt starts to fall asleep so that's my only advice but on that note of my butt falling asleep I just wanted to say thanks to you first officer Mark for all you do continued safe travels and thanks for joining us today it's my pleasure all right well that does it for uh, uh, dispatchers answering your questions stay tuned because I might actually be able to get a hold of Morgan to do a video uh, so we will see what happens but for now it's me Pip at DFW Airport and Founders Plaza signing off until next time